This is not my opinion, this is a fact. The coolest swim bait anybody could possibly make is a baby muskie. Now that we have that established, let's get to work. And now that we've gotten to work, let's establish something. Fun facts on muskies. Fun facts. The muskelunge. M-U-S-K-E-L-L-U-N-G-E. -L -L -E. Muskelunge, right? You'll let me know. Often shortened to musky, musky, <laughs> musky with an I-E or a musky with a Y, or just a lunge. It's the largest member of the pike family. So technically it's a pike. You could call this fish a pike and technically still be correct. The origins of this fish there's, there's the word, I'm not gonna attempt to say it. Mashkanuji. Those people, whatever that word was, and they, they called them Mashkanujis, meaning great fish. And it is a great fish. They weren't wrong, they just have a crazy language. These fish tend to be aggressive. This entire family of fish are pretty freaking aggressive. Um, they're ambush predators. They'll sit on the banks or around structure, they'll hide, and they'll see something coming by, and they, that something could be like 20 feet away and it will rocket itself straight to that thing and spear the bait and yeah, it's my favorite kind of fish to fish for is um, small mouth because they're so easy to catch and I'm, but my second favorite kind of fish are pike and muskie and pickerel. Pike, we're fishing for pike guys. I always say that in my videos. So muskie are typically 28 inches to 48 inches. You catch a 48 inch muskie, that's a doozy. Some have reached up to six feet. So six times 12, it's a big number, 72 inches. That's, that's an insane muskie, almost 70 pounds. According to some references, muskies can even reach up to eight feet, but we're talking legendary mythical muskie here. We're not talking normal. Um, it's never been confirmed that a muskie has been that big. What is the world record? Martin Arthur Williamson caught a muskie with a weight of 61 and a quarter pound. 27.8 kilograms. November 2000, in the Georgian Bay. That might not be a world record, but that's a big muskie. It always, it's always weird when you talk about world records and fish, you know? Like maybe some guy somewhere did catch a bigger fish than whatever the world record says, you know? But didn't have a camera. He just tells his buddies and they don't believe him. Then he commits suicide because it's... Well, that got dark. So the description that Wikipedia gives you of what colors these fish are is light silver, brown, green, dark vertical stripes on the flank, which may tend to break up into spots. In some cases, the markings may be absent altogether. They really covered their butt when it comes to describing their colors and stuff. I always thought of it as a muskie's got dark spots and a light body, and a pike has light spots with a darker body. To be certain whether you caught a pike or a muskie, you count their sensory pores. It's on the underside of their mandibles. A muskie will have seven or more, and then a pike never has more than six. Most people can just look at the fish and tell that it's a muskie or a pike, though. Yeah, we got them in Iowa. They're in Nebraska. They're in Minnesota. They're probably in Missouri a little bit. Uh, then you keep going east. They're definitely in Wisconsin, probably in Illinois. They're in Ohio, Michigan. They're around that area, mostly. And then Canada, yeah, I'm just talking about the United States. Can Canada's full of them too. They're not native in Maine, so they've been introduced to the waters in Maine. But in Maine, anglers are actually encouraged not to release them back in the water. They're trying to maintain their precious trout populations and stuff like that, so. Oh wow, they're even in the Tennessee River Valley. Oh, they're in the Broad River in South Carolina too. Wow, anybody from South Carolina ever catch a muskie? That's crazy. Found in the Red River drainage of the Hudson Bay. And then in Utah, they've introduced hybrid tiger muskellunge in their reservoirs and stuff. That's cool. They're not everywhere, of course, but they're they're around. So muskies bite their prey, and then they churn it around, or they turn themselves around, and then they eat things head first. A lot of fish do that. And they eat a lot of different stuff. Where they live, there is nothing badder than them. They are capable of eating prey up to two-thirds of their body length due to their large stomachs. And they're capable of biting stuff in half and portioning it up and eating it still. And muskrats, ducks, your cat, hide your pets, hide your kids, don't put your babies in the water. There's musky in there. Musky fishing's a big deal, very big deal. Big market, lots of people do it. Lots of people are extremely serious about it. The hours that those people have to put on the water are insane. I'm gonna do it someday once I get a boat. I got a uh, pond, I got a lake with some hybrid musky in it near me. 
and I want to get on those, but I need a boat when, I, when I'm fishing there for them. But they even have charts and stuff showing the curve for length and girth and what the weight's gonna be. That way you can just measure those two things, take a picture, you don't have to put it on a scale and hurt their jaw and stuff and then throw it back in the water. Get that thing released. Sometimes muskies form small groups of roving gangs around the, around the lake. Small schools of muskie in distinct territories. They're picky about who they become friends with. But if you come across a roving gang of muskies, go around. They spawn in a rock or a sand bottom so that their eggs don't sink into the mud and suffocate. They say the eggs are negatively buoyant, so the eggs sink and they're slightly adhesive. They adhere to both the plants and vegetation and the bottom of the lake. And once they're adhered, they're abandoned. No maternity. They just poop out the eggs and leave. Within two weeks, they got two weeks to survive, completely helpless. But once after that two weeks, no, they didn't hatch. They just developed a mouth. The egg just developed a mouth and it's gonna eat zooplankton. Not even vegetation, just zooplankton, or zooplankton, some people call it. Then it comes out of the yolk soon after that, so it's not, it's not having to live. It, it developed a mouth and it's able to eat zooplankton while it's still an egg. That's just kind of cool. Kind of shows how mean this fish is. Then it comes out of the egg, and then it you know, can start preying upon uh, small fish, minnows, juvenile stuff. The ones that make it are pretty tough. They're actually apex predators kind of tough. Only humans pose a threat to this fish. And the, the only threat, mostly the only threat to uh, younger muskies, smaller muskies, or other adult muskies. So we'll see. I might get a bass on this baby muskie. I've caught bass on bigger stuff than that, so. Attack on humans. Muskies attacking humans. Where's, where's Jerry Wade? Is that his name? River Monsters guy? He did an episode. Dangle your feet off the boat and a 60 inch muskie comes up and bites your leg off. Is that what happens? It's extremely rare to be attacked by a muskie. You gotta really be making some some body part of yours looking like a lure or, some, or something that a muskie would wanna eat. Careful, don't go skinny dipping in the muskie waters. Other than that, it's just a fish. Uh, as far as fun facts goes, when it comes to fish, a lot of the time they're not that interesting, so. Other than that, it's just a fish. Fun facts are over. It's always difficult knowing when to start talking again in the video after fun facts because haven't shot them yet in real time, but I'm guessing now, so. Next step, get an impeccable camera angle of my crotch. Here we go. Tail fin. I'm one of these guys that, see I do, I do my tail fins at a time when most people don't. Most people when the lure's still in a block shape, they cut their tail fin. I like to carve everything out and then cut my tail fin. That way I only have to be accurate on this step instead of every other step. You have to cut to all the lines and be really accurate. I more just freehand it, eyeball the shape, make it look straight. It is, I've done this so many times. It's, this, that's straight. And now I just cut my tail fin straight. Eyeball it, make a real straight line here, right in the middle of the tail back here. This bait's gonna have a thin very thin Lexan tail fin, about the thickness of this saw. And I think I'm gonna glue it in and have it secured before I start painting it even, and just paint it all together with the bait. Here's the shape of everything though. I got that gnarly front underbite. The eyeball is gonna go pretty much just slightly forward, but centered with that crease right there. Since it's a baby muskie, I gave it more of a round shape. Real muskies are just pretty much flat along the entirety of the body. And then back here, it dips in. I'm not gonna do the uh, anal fin or the a top fin, dorsal fin. Just keep it simple, clean, beautiful, baby muskie, four piece, three joint swim bait. I just went into explain-o mode right there. Let's get back to work. A protractor is a pretty useful tool for making a tail fin. This is a 10 centimeter measurement, and then I always try to get the five right in the center of the tail fin and just measuring off of these two ends, and then I have all the degrees here, and I can just make my mark. Let's go with 120 and 60 here. 90 is the center, so you go off of that, and boom. We have the general dimensions of the tail fin here. Of course, it's not gonna be that shape, but those are the parameters we just established. I'm pretty sure that musky tail fins are all scraggly and ugly. Probably the uglier the better, I would guess. 
Yeah, that's nice and ugly. Putting a little pointy thin bit in the Dremel here. And to make sure we capture all this ugliness, I'm gonna use a, a Dremel to get it, get it nice and detailed and good. So now, we're putting this bit in. It's like a flat disc, but you use the edge of the disc on this bit. And I'm not gonna mark every single spine out. I'm just gonna be doing this. Keeping it ugly. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna wanna maintain some long cuts that go from here to here, you know, here to there, and not not get all like choo 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 with it, just with it. I hope those sound effects got my point across. That's pretty good. I mean, it's not perfectly a representation of a musky fin, but because, you know, I used a Dremel and I didn't take hours to carve each tiny spine, but you know, just entire picture kind of thing. That's, that's gorgeous. I need to do the other side still. Those grooves are definitely gonna show up with the paint and everything. I'm happy with that. That's very good. I haven't done it this way before. That, that was the first. I'm gonna do the other side, I'll get back to you. Hello, I'm back and I'm gluing that fin in that we just made right now. Why wait? There might be a reason why to wait and I'm overlooking it, but as of now, why wait? I didn't get it on camera, but I actually cracked that back piece. I didn't crack all the way through and it didn't, it didn't fall out or fall apart, but I'm like three gorges dam just broke, super glue's coming out of it and putting it on this crack. We're getting it sealed back up. Was that joke a little harsh? I'm sorry, I'm getting too comfortable around you guys. Just send it in there though. But we still have yet to carve the gills and detail into the face. So I'm not gonna seal this whole thing with super glue yet, but what a beautiful tail fin. I really like that. It was quick too. I like it when it's nice, like it looks very good and it's quick. That's a good feeling. I'm burping on camera. I'm getting way too comfortable around you guys. All right, time to carve. Let's get the sharp things out. Off camera, I drew and scored those lines. I always feel better about my drawings and sketching up the details off camera for some reason, but I don't do it often, but I just did, so. Now you just cut to the lines. You get a feel for how deep, how much material to remove while you're cutting to the lines over time, and it's a preference thing. But depending on what you do, it can change the whole look of the bait. That bug zapper, man. It's just smoking. It's box elder bugs. Those dang box elder bugs all over the siding right now. They're getting in here and getting fried. And I'm just laughing. I hate those bugs. Completely harmless, but sometimes you just gotta hate a bug, you know? I think that 
No, it needs way more haulage. What am I thinking? I'm thinking crankbait for some reason. It needs way more lead than that. Although, I am having better luck with bigger baits towards the surface right now. Oops. And if I could get this to be some kind of, you know, surface running wake bait, I could probably catch a fish with it easier. It'll be a bit before I'm filling these holes up with lead, but let's just leave it at that. We'll see. We'll see. It's a wonderful answer to everything. We'll see. Boom! Oh, sorry. You guys didn't even see that. Boom! Joints are cut. I'm gonna do some sanding to this line, and this line, and that line, and that line. Right now, the joint pieces are like this. I'm just gonna do this with them a little bit. Okay, yeah. We're ready to seal with super glue. I put a tiny bit of more detail in the head here. I should probably show you guys. Did a little something something under the eye and then a nostril. Baby musky. You know what, I'm not gonna do super glue. I could lose some detail if I do that. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna dip it in polyurethane and wait. Let's be patient. Let's make this bait nice. Let's get to dipping. I've gotten in this habit where I kind of make lures more blocky than I used to. For a good reason, and I'm specifically talking wooden lures here. The blockier they are, the more wood that's in them, the more buoyant the body will be. The more buoyant the body is, the more it acts against the lead that you put in the bait. You'll need more lead, but it's just, it's keeping it upright more. And when your bait's upright more, and it's a big swim bait like this, it has a better chance of playing against the forces that are being put on each side of the bait and it will swim better. That's kind of, I don't know. I'm a little self-conscious about how blocky this bait is, but paint can fix that. Shading and putting the paint in the right spots will make it look better. I don't know if self-conscious was the right word right there either. Probably was. Time for some dippy poos. I got dust and crap on my bait while I'm dipping it, putting it in a can. That looks beautiful though. Absolutely gorgeous. There's a musky head. Baby musky, man. Hoping this doesn't take away the detail on that fin. You know what? Let's do this right. Sorry, there's something in my mouth right now. I can't really talk. A screw eye. I guess it does not need to be in my mouth. Let's not get it all over that fin. And I'm just gonna get a little clip and hang it that way. I'll wash this stuff as it dries. Make sure I don't get any drips. Remove them if so like that and that. But it's not painting after that's ready. It's lead pot time, so I'll have that hot for when it's ready. I need to wait a few hours at least for that. Lead's hot. Very, very hot. I did that a little too early. Can you see the bubbling? That's evaporating off the polyurethane. It'll be fine. It'll still be fine. So I will still do the next piece as well. <laughs> this whole thing's getting another coat of polyurethane, so I'm not too worried about it. Super good bike, so. Ouch. That went right up a nostril. You don't want that. Makes your eyes sting for a while. I'm not crying. That's the power of super glue and baking soda. Whew. Just lost a mental year off of my life.
Your best line of defense against bumps when you're trying to sand something smooth is your fingers. Like you gotta feel if it's bumpy or not. A lot of the time you can't see it at all. And that's smooth, both of these. This bait is weighed. I believe, I think it's gonna be a wake bait. Top water, slithering along, injured baby muskie, up for grabs. Next day, therefore this lure is extremely dry and ready to paint. And we're not starting with white. <laughs> starting with gray. Why? Because uh, muskies are just this way, that's why. I don't know, this is how I paint a muskie and I start with gray for some reason. Even on the belly of a muskie, it's dirty. It will have a white belly, but I'll just show you. It's a nice light gray. I just busted another nozzle. I just, oh, that hurts. Oh. Oh. I just dropped my airbrush on the ground, but it landed back first, and it slammed that needle straight through that nozzle. And it's busted. I really need it. I, that's like the second time this month I did that. I used to never drop my airbrush. What's happening? I'm gonna go to Hobby Lobby and get some airbrush parts. Finn decked me in the nose with a baby monitor the other night, or the other morning. That's the damage. There's not supposed to be that giant crack in it right there. I need a new one of these, and I think I need another half inch nozzle, because I think that this needle opened this up a lot. It's not supposed to be able to do that. Okay, see you later. Well, I looked for parts. They had one. Where's my phone? Okay, left my phone on the truck. They had one part that I needed, and this part actually isn't even designed for the Iwata HPCS, which is my airbrush, and I've always kind of had the predisposition anyway to get a new one and use this one for soft plastic paint and use this one for, you know, this sort of stuff. But mainly I just wanted this, a sticker. <laughs> just kidding. Shiny and brand new. Look at that thing, beautiful. We're gonna paint a pretty musky today, fellas. And after just breaking my old one, you think I'm gonna keep this stuff on here? No. Ain't nobody got time for this crap. Needle guards. I scoff at needle guards. All right, now this airbrush is functional. One sec, I gotta get the Teflon tape out and get this set up. Look how shiny it is in there. That's what I like to see. It's always a pleasure using a brand spanking new airbrush. Shoots perfect. We're right where we were, starting with gray. I'm not explaining why again. You guys watch Wrangler Star? The homesteader guy from Oregon, he always says things, give him the fizz, you know? The fizz. This gives me the fizz. I came back with some detail white and I added Mostly at an angle, but not completely, but that's what happens when you come back with a detail white and then you have really good deep carvings like that. You get a lot of detail to show up. And that's kind of how you have to treat these carvings. If, you, if I come back in here with a different color and just dump it in there, it's, it's, they're gonna go away, all that detail will. Yeah, colors. I'm going with detail sapia. This is my reference picture. I think that is a nice mix of, you know, it's got the bars, it's got all the colors. There's the brown, there's the green, there's a little bit of blue, and then there's almost an orange on the belly too. That looks really good. Mostly silvery and pearlized though. This will be a beautiful bait, I do believe. Detail sapia on the top. What is today? 
October 12th, out here in the middle of nowhere on an acre of land, and we got mowers going anyway. They're here, they found me. We got lawn mowers running. Before you know it, there's gonna be construction just outside this garage door. There is no escape. Don't try to escape it. It is futile. Detail sapia. Natural. Nice little naturalness there. Yep, there we go. Next color. Now what I am seeing in the body of this muskie is a yellow or gold, more gold. You can't be fooled by the glare. There's a glare on that fish in that picture and it's very white by the head and down the body a little bit. But if you look, if you look further down the body, I don't know, it's a flesh tone. It's like a bone color, an off-white. But I don't want to just splib it a bunch of off-white onto this, onto the side of this, because it's gonna, that's not gonna look good. So I need, I need like something thin and transparent. Or maybe I should just make the scales like that. I wanted to do silver, like just silver for the scales over everything that I painted. So I, I can't really do it that way. Let's make an off-white color and let's get, let's be careful. I'm gonna be careful with an off-white color. That's what I'm gonna do. Buttload of white in the cup. I'm gonna do a drop of yellow ochre, not ocher, like I said before in the last video. Ochre, that's a big drop. Good Lord, okay. And a drop of flesh tone. Let's see what I've created. Um, yeah, it's, that's very bright. It's mostly white still. Let's get some reducer in here for transparency purposes. Yeah, I'm appreciating that. That's not bad. That's almost, maybe the camera's not picking it up, but that's like a darker bone color. A lot of people like the bone color today. And it's just an off-white. I, I think it's just like the color of whatever the resin the lure's made out of is, and they don't even have to paint the lure, but a lot of people like that color, and it is effective. But this is darker, and I'm kind of liking it. That's not bad. Center of the bait. I'm going down the middle of the whole bait with this. I'm coming back with a different color. This this isn't this is good, but it's not right. It's adding that little highlight though to the center of the body. I'm gonna come back with a reduced ochre yellow. Let's get this color out of here. There we go. Super, super slight tint of yellow, but that lighter color before put the highlight in the right spot. That is musky. There we go. Very nice. We really have the base coat of a musky. I'm, I'm probably the most happiest out of all of us about that. That uh, silvery, tiny tint of yellow color. Dark bone, whatever you want to call it, is really there. Next, I am going to do what I can about those stripes. What I'm seeing is a bluish green. And a good bluish green, Viridian, I believe. I'm gonna freehand some stripes with this color. I'm gonna lay this bait out though. Let's lay it on the table. This color is extremely saturated, I guess you would say. It comes through very well, so I'm gonna have to kind of be careful and not give it too much. There's a lateral line on a muskie straight down the center, and the marks are kind of divided top and bottom. So, okay, here we go. Yes, I totally agree, that's way too bright. That's too much color, but it will all get fixed. Then they got some spots at the bottom. Just put a smidget, just a tiny tent of it behind the eye too. It's as though it wanted to be green, but it's not. It's, there's a little bit of green in those marks, but they need to be controlled. I'm gonna go over them with a detail smoke black. That was my chair. That was not a fart. That's gonna make them extremely dark though. Maybe a gray. We got the gray we need. Let's fix this. That's looking good. All 
All right, a lot of that green color is gonna go away too once I get the scales on here. That's gonna be realistic. Starting to really like this technique for multiple segmented lures. Lures. Just nail the mesh to your table. That way you can be certain that you're even. Get your bait lined up nicely and nail that mesh over it. You can get it pretty tight this way too. Silver, and then I'm gonna do some kind of pearl. Purple. Maybe color shift purple. Green to purple. Martian green, but it color shifts to purple and it's mostly purple. That's what I'm using. This is a chameleon paint. A lot of muskie have a color shift purple on them on their top flank. Perfect. Let's unveil these scales. Was that too much? That was too much. Dang it. Dang it. Dang it. Dang it. <laughs> well, now I have to do the exact same thing to the other side and fix both sides at the same time. I'm having a hard time with this paint job. But yeah, that, that covered up too much. But like I said, the other side needs to get the same treatment and then fix it. I guess when you tilt it, it's not so bad. You can really see the purple. Maybe that's the key. Oh, this hurts to do, but I gotta do it. There we go, too much silver and the perfect amount of purple. I've been adding a little bit of colors here and there. I'm going back over the details I already put on the bait. I even added a little bit of fluorescent orange to the belly right there. But back in with the sapia, the brown, coming down the stripes with it a bit, that defined them a little bit better. You can still see the hints of green, that bluish green. Did a little bit of color on the scales there. The rest of this bait is very touchy-feely when it comes to the painting. Just looking at the picture and just trying to realize what needs, what needs done. Other than that, this might just be a montage of different things I do to this bait for the paint job. See you when it's done. I put some platinum on those gill plates. That looks good. All natural. Along with the tail fin. I guess this isn't a montage. I'm still talking. Sorry. I think that when it comes to the colors of a baby muskie, that's a juvenile muskie right there, we really are not too far off. I don't think we're off at all. I think that's spot on. And look at these. Perfect little 10 millimeter muskie eyes from Dead Meat Customs. Check them out on Instagram. I, d I don't have my mirror up with all my stickers and stuff on it, but Dead Meat Customs on Instagram. This is gonna be a spectacular little eye for this bait. It's gonna match perfect. Oopsie poopsie doopsie, whoops. I'm being a slob. That did not need glue. That was a tight fit, <laughs> but it's got glue on it anyway. Oh man. That is a gorgeous eye for this bait. You couldn't match it more perfect. And it's got some of its own color, a little bit of chartreuse. I think that always looks good when the eye has a little bit of its own color. Whew. I kind of overlooked this step. I know you're not surprised. It happens all the time with me. But this bait needs a line tie and hook hangers. So let's get those installed, <laughs> I suppose. Just going with the good old secure twist wires, nice and clean. Not giant chunks of steel, just twisted 0.041 inch diameter stainless steel wire. Good old twist wires. I tell you what, these are tight too. It's gonna be a good fit in case I need to pull in my 50 inch musky from the baby musky. Wouldn't that be insane? We catch a musky on a baby musky. That would be the ultimate catch for this video. No guarantees that that will happen. And I'm getting a little scared, Alumalite. I've been waiting for this Aluma UV 
to restock on your website because I'm getting low, very low. Because even though it has some drawbacks, this is still my favorite clear coat. Makes it quick and easy, but beautiful at the same time. It stays thick and you cure it that way and it's a good clear coat. Solid lure making stuff. If you haven't tried this and you're a lure maker, give it a shot. You might not like it. No guarantees once again, but I love it. Look at that iridescence. Purpley-ish, greenish, silvery-ish. A little bit of orange on the belly. Mm. This bait might be getting two coats because this bait's so beautiful and like there's four pieces and I worked a long time on it. Two coats makes a huge difference with this stuff. One coat, it's like meh, durability. It'll last you a while, but two coats is like full on, two part epoxy, clear coat, Envirotex kind of stuff, durability. Envirotex is like the old faithful. For those all the old school basement bait builders, Envirotex light, two part epoxy, that was the stuff. Today there's like True Coat and others and this stuff and stuff you can spray out of a can and it's pretty durable even. I'm probably talking about something right now that a lot of people have no idea about, but it was my life back in the day. It was called the Musky First Basement Bait Maker Forum. I used to post to that thing all the time, my little lure creations. But on that forum they would share everything that they know about bait making and all the supplies and stuff. So it's still up, you just type in Musky First Basement yeah, basement bait making form. You can find a lot of information on making lures. Look at that beautiful thing. Look at you. Each piece, one at a time, check for any drippage. Pretty much the first 10 seconds anything's in here with the clear coat on it, it's gonna harden that clear coat, but it's not gonna get it fully cured. I check each piece. Make sure there's no drippage. Everything's fine. I hold it the other way for just a bit. Then I put it in. Don't let those pieces touch either when you're hanging them in here. Partially cured clear coat touching itself gets real sticky and stringy and just a mess. And this is going to get just a stupid amount of time in here. I'll probably be doing this for a few hours because I need to put another clear coat on these too. Put them back in the tank, so see you in a few hours. What an insane difference a clear coat makes. I like to open those holes up just a bit so I can pretty much pour thin super glue in there. That's the process on three joints here. And then to secure the other pieces, you have to install two at a time and just, and I tend to just have these holes filled with super glue when I do that. But you don't wanna fill them too much because you'll shove that twist wire in and then it will squeeze it out of the hole and it'll run down the side of your bait and ruin the look of your clear coat and you don't want that. You don't want that. I'm gonna open up those holes with the pokey thing, get super glue in there. Don't feel in a rush. That's when things go bad. Even though you might be in a rush, don't feel in a rush. Just pretend you got all the time in the world. Install the joint. Beautiful. A little bit of super glue goes a surprisingly long way, especially with these types of joints. There's the connection though. Very even. Very perpendicular to each other, that's important. If these are kind of diagonal, and tilt it against each other, you won't get full movement in the joint. But there's no resistance to that. It's a pendulum. Just like that. I just put the hooks on. Bait's done. Let me get a nice seat here. One sec. We need better lighting. I don't know where to hold it. Look at that. This is one of those baits when you put it together and get the whole picture together like that, looks 50 times better. All the joints are nice and beautifully even. Two anchor points on each joint, keeps it upright. And nothing does this, it just does that. Goodness gracious, baby musky. Let's see how much this weighs. Well, I can't get every little piece of this bait on the scale, but it's reading less than three. It's 2.6 right now, and this piece can't weigh that much. So less than three, I can use my three ounce St. Croix rod. Let's go see what'll eat a baby musky. Oops. At the pond with the baby musky. 
I think it's time for thumbnail. Good enough. It floats. Wow, really slush sloshes too. Wow. We should be able to get some interest in this bait. Got him. Oh. He might go for it again. That was a good pike. Oh, there it is again. It's not hitting it, it's just, it's playing with it. That is not a small pike either. Those were a couple of significant pike hits on the baby muskie but that pond seemed like it went a little dead. So I'm switching it up. It's not, it's, this is a pond about a mile away from where that one was. There's pike in that pond because the river feeds it. And also the river feeds this one. There should be good pike in this one. People don't go here much because it's a mile away from the parking spot. So I'm gonna get to walk in. Hopefully the sun's a little lower once I get there. And hopefully there's bigger pike in that pond and they're hungry. Cause I got a baby musky for him. By the way, I found some scratches. Little bit of pike teeth right there. I would say the sun is down. This is pretty much nighttime fishing right now. See you tomorrow, fellas. I don't do this often, but it's morning. Good morning. Same spot, only because we had those bites. Wish me luck. I need to go somewhere else. The infamous pike spot. This is my last attempt at catching a fish. I've come to a lake with hybrid muskie in it, tiger muskie. The wind is horrendous. There's like two foot waves out there right now. But I'm gonna drag this baby muskie across the surface and we're gonna catch a muskie. Ouch. Oh, there's a thistle in my foot. Oh, through the thickets. That was over 12 hours of fishing with this bait. That is for sure the longest I've ever spent on video fishing with one lure. Really strange. I might be like one or two weeks just right out of the time frame where I'm good for top water with a big bait like that. But there was 10 minutes and it might've just been one pike getting one last meal. But within 10 minutes, I had those two strikes from that pike. That was cool to see. It's unfortunate I didn't hook up, but just didn't pin them good enough. That was all up to chance. That, that The fish decided to hit, just did not get hooked up well enough. It's about that time. On to the next bait. <laughs> get the sharp things out. Woo! It went right up a nostril. Probably the uglier the better. Very, very hot. It's just smoking. Was that too much? That was too much. I'm getting too comfortable around you guys.